Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for coming along to our Language uh, Teachers Forum. Great pleasure in um, inviting Clayton Forno from Somerville House, just across the road, um, back again um, today. It's um, been a popular speaker. We've got quite a few people on um, go to meeting, and we do have um, all these um, pr presentations on on our website now, so you'll be able to see the the past ones if you um, if you'd like to to do that. So I think. We're all interested in languages promotion in schools, so um, Clayton is revisiting for us today. So thanks very much, Clayton. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and um, it's um, great to be with you. I just thought I'd um, give a few thoughts at the start um, just about the importance of your, our um, work in teaching languages or being involved in the teaching of languages. We work in a truly admirable profession, so here's to us, um, but more particularly uh, teaching languages. Languages are not a luxury anymore, they are, they are a necessity. Uh, we work in an essential service. In languages we are helping other humans satisfy some basic needs, and this is why it's so important to communicate and to connect with each other. I note that in um, psychology, connecting with others is seen as uh, a good step towards good mental health. And in this day and age, we all know how basic and important and fundamental that is. Um, and connecting with others and being part of the lives of others and seeking companionship from others perhaps explains why in prisons, for example, uh, the punishment of solitary confinement is seen as so su such a big thing to remove somebody from that basic human need which is to connect with others. Um, it also inspired the um, sermon by the poet and uh, Church of England cleric John Donne who wrote No Man is an Island uh, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I enjoyed reading that and it brought back memories of when I was uh, in school. And apologies for the gender specific language, but it was written at a, um, a particular time. <clears throat> While on the topic of humans connecting uh, with other humans, last year at my school, Somerville House, we welcomed a group of girls from our sister school in Hangzhou in China. Um, at their farewell afternoon tea, I addressed our visitors and thanked them uh, for coming to Somerville House. And I noted that over the two weeks of the visit, I saw Chinese visitors and Australian host students and many of their friends. You know what kids are like. They like to come over and meet the new uh, the visitors. Having fun together, speaking in Chinese, English and sometime, sometimes a mixture of both, laughing and enjoying life together. I also noted in my speech that what they did together was very powerful and that this was a force for good and the well-being of our world and that they could teach a lesson to many adults around the world, many political leaders around the world, who rather than bring cultures together, try to drive them apart to everybody's detriment. We have for a long time promoted languages learning uh, in schools and universities uh, and doing a great job at it. Languages being an elective uh, in, in many schools, obviously promotion of them is always uh, very important. What I mean by languages promotion for the purposes of this presentation is not so much our actions, uh, for example, organising languages, events, competitions and so forth, but the words we use to send messages to students, um, parents and the school community, uh, I'll call them stakeholders, about the benefits of studying languages. Examples of these are talks we do at subject information evenings, informal talks with parents and students, etc. Um, so, in my presentation, I'm going to show examples of things that uh, we might currently discuss uh, when talking to stakeholders about the benefits of langu learning languages. 
But like any other area relating to education, it's good to revisit our current practices uh, and update as necessary. So I want to take you on a little journey through some ideas um, I've become passionate about uh, and that have come from what I've read and also some personal experience along uh, my teaching journey. Um, and it's interesting when you start, when you read a book, um, and the great thing is when Lee invited me to do a talk, I got reading some books and that gets you on to other readings and that gets then gets you onto the internet because you like to read the author's websites and so forth. So that's been a real benefit from learning journey for me. I'd like to propose that adding these ideas to our repertoire of messages to stakeholders about the benefits of learning um, languages. So my job today, therefore, is to propose an expanded framework of languages promotion. Um, many of the extra issues I discuss might be seen as preaching to the converted, but I do think it's beneficial to make these issues explicit uh, in sending messages to our stakeholders about the benefits of languages. I also want to make it clear that this is only my contribution to languages promotion and a real passion of mine, but I can't possibly claim to know it all, uh, and so would greatly value and take note of uh, your ideas and, and, in, and input. I showed this to my Year 9s the other day. Uh, I'm talking to Year 9s uh, after the holidays, but I've started, for the purposes of this presentation, I sort of showed them a few slides and got their reactions to things. Um, and I've already talked to Year 10s um, as uh, head of department talking about our four languages at Somerville House, French, German, Chinese and Japanese. And we talk about the big wide world and we look at languages and travels, uh, I think, often in terms of this perspective of the world. And we, it looks uh, like the places are very far away and that to travel to countries and learn their languages is a really big thing. But I also like the benefit of perspective. And if we put this into perspective, this is our galaxy, Milky Way, obviously, in the middle there. And that arrow is pointing to our sun and our solar system. And a science teacher, I sat down with some science teachers in the common room the other day, explained because I don't know a lot about science. And they explained to me that if, you, if the sun were an orange that you put on the table, the earth would be a really tiny little speck of dust that you wouldn't be able to see. And uh, if you're talking in terms of distance, the Earth would probably be halfway to the Gold Coast. Um, and I'm wondering if that changes perspectives a little bit. I spoke to my Year 9 students and um, prompted uh, a little bit of discussion because I said that I believe sometimes in, in miracles, and I think that this is a real miracle. This little speck of dust here that is uh, planet Earth is the only tiny little part of the observable universe that supports life. Uh, everything else is dust and rock uh, and chemicals and so forth. Human beings that we know of can only live on, on planet Earth. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that on that planet, unlike anywhere else in the universe, there are 7.7, .7, approximately 7.7 .7 billion human beings, all of different cultural backgrounds, uh, different colours, different beliefs or otherwise. Um, and amongst those 7.7 .7 billion people, there are approximately 6,500 languages spoken between them. And I think that's an absolute miracle. And I got my year nines talking a little bit more and we came to the conclusion that when we look at the Earth from that perspective, as opposed to the bigger perspective I just showed you, then it makes sense, doesn't it, to learn as many of those languages spoken by the 7.7 .7 billion people on that tiny speck of dust because it's part of a, a real miracle. Um, and Certainly I encourage you, if you'd like to access the PowerPoint, show that to your students and 
get it talking around about subject selection um, time. Uh, as I say, perspective is a really good thing, and I like to use perspective when I promote languages to students. So I say, what about telling them this? 6,500 languages approximately, linguists can't, uh, you know, they can only give us a, an approximation. 6,500 languages in the world, and I'm only asking you to learn one more on top of your native tongue. So then you can have a little joke with them and say, then you've only got 6,498 languages to go. Um, my students don't laugh at me, perhaps your students <laughs> will. Um, <clears throat> the humans on that tiny speck of planet Earth have bodies and brains that have evolved to respond to context and needs, and the brain in relation to language learning accordingly has evolved to become better and better at learning languages. Presumably as tribes interacted a lot more, um, and there was a, a greater need to learn languages and so the brain evolved. We talk about the notion of neuroplasticity, and I'll come back to that, uh, which is about the brain adapting itself to suit its needs, which is a gift from evolution. I, uh, I'm wondering if you'd like to tell this to your students. Uh, let's pick a number. We know that the brain is capable of learning, of storing several languages. And I'll come to that soon. But if the brain is capable of storing, let's say, let's pick a number and say 12 languages uh, with a very high degree of proficiency, then if you only speak one, you're only using one twelfth of your brain's capacity to learn languages. That's like buying a car and only using one twelfth of its functionality. I love to say this to students. Or being given 12 presents for your birthday and only opening one. Or someone running a marathon, feeling great and injury free and more than capable of finishing and getting a personal best, but stopping after 3.51 kilometres, which is roughly a twelfth of a marathon. Um, there are studies that say that learning a language can make you live longer. There are quite a few studies around that um, now, and that makes sense. So let's put learning languages up there on the level of exercising and eating a healthy diet. So I think doctors should say, exercise, healthy diet, don't smoke, drink in moderation, and learn a language. Um, I, some of my students, their parents are in the medical profession, and I said, you should suggest that to your parents. I'm waiting to get feedback on that. It'd be interesting. For this reason, they are to, they, um, I'm aware that, uh, that languages are taught in some aged care facilities uh, with the obvious intention of extending people's lives and keeping their brains active. So I say to my students that if, um, if they're teaching 95-year-olds languages, you're 14, surely I should be able to teach you a language. And I um, love seeing kids' reactions when you say this. So now for the presentation um, proper. Some typical things mentioned uh, in promoting languages. Obviously, we talk about, and these are all great things and apply very much to today, restaurant outings, immersion, cultural days, guest speakers, exchange programs. I really love to talk them up when I'm talking to students. You can go to Japan for 10 weeks and have a Japanese student stay with you and make a, a lifelong friend uh, and go into the start of year 11 or the start of year 12 speaking really fantastic Japanese. Study tours, language competitions, ordering food in or bento lunches, I always make sure I put in my orders for that, and technology in the classroom that students really like to do. Uh, we tell students that languages can enhance career opportunities, translation, diplomacy, tourism, the list goes on. And these are just some examples. They, languages can do wonders for your cognitive skills. We know that people think at a higher level, people who speak more than one language, think a lot more deeply and a lot more flexibly um, than somebody who is monolingual. Uh, help you with your first language, and I have several studies, and I enjoy 
And I'm thankful to uh, Marcel, um, who uh, often sends emails out with um, languages promotional material. And I, I downloaded something like 40 studies, and they're just the ones that, that I have, that actually um, have studied the effect of learning another language on other areas of the curriculum. So it can help you with your L1, um, it can help you with your literacy and so forth. So I like to talk about that. Promote well peace and intercultural awareness and understanding. Help you to make lifelong friends and help you to be more creative. Um, <clears throat> so I'm wondering if you've heard these things said before, however. Uh, I certainly have. I was never able to learn French, Chinese, Japanese, German, Spanish, etc. Um, who, who do you think, ha have you heard people say that? Um, maybe older people, um, parents, neighbours. Um, it's interesting that these messages, I always cringe when I hear that because I think of the messages that sends to our young people and I think that that needs to be addressed. Uh, have you heard this said before? I'm not doing a language that's only for smart kids. Um, you've got to be smart. And particularly as all of the students who've been talking in their breaks who are saying, I'm doing, I'm continuing on with a the language, they're the kids who've been getting really high grades. Uh, and then a student who doesn't get uh, grades that are that high says, well, obviously it's just for the smart kids. I've got this a few times. Uh, I used to teach in a, in a boys' school um, earlier on. but So I only taught uh, in a boys' school for four years, um, and I've been in girls' schools for the last, coming up, 17 years. When I was in a boys' school, I, I heard this, boys just aren't good, good at learning languages, are they? What are you? So, <laughs> that's right, and I see a lot of, uh, I see men uh, amongst you now. This one here, the subjects that prepare students for NAPLAN the most are the core subjects of English and maths. Um, and I actually heard a uh, um, parent um, early on in um, my career when NAPLAN first came out, and the parent said, you know, obviously all the students are really focusing on their English and maths at the moment because that's what's going to get them good grades in, in NAPLAN. Uh, obviously, this isn't a discussion about NAPLAN and people have um, views about NAPLAN, but I do think that NAPLAN, the, the issue of NAPLAN needs to be addressed when it comes to languages and I'll come to that uh, soon. So, oh yes, this one, I want to be a lawyer in Australia eventually so I don't need to know another language. Um, I've had that quite a bit. I want to practice medicine in Australia. I don't want to leave Australia so I don't need another language. So, some further considerations, and I'd like to take you through uh, a little journey, if you like, as I mentioned in my introduction, of some thoughts that I've been having um, and some things that I've been reading, and I'll take you through those, and then I'd like to conclude with some implications for languages promotion. Firstly, um, we've talked about this a lot, and everybody is very, very familiar with about this. They talk about this in schools and universities, and that is Carol Dweck's mindset. Um, it has to do with uh, people's ability to make themselves better learners, to um, uh, refute the traditional notion that if you're not born good at something, then you'll never be good at that thing. You're either born good at something or you're born not good at that thing and there's nothing really much you can do about it. Just go to where your talents lie. Um, there is, of course, a notion in the language learning literature and in the broader literature about aptitude. Um, Lightburn and Sparta talk about aptitude as one of the factors that contribute to success in learning a language. So, in other words, some people have a better ear than others um, some people can learn vocabulary a lot, a lot faster than others. People learn at different speeds. So aptitude is a very big issue in languages. But I believe that the traditional view is that if you have an aptitude, it's only the people who have a strong aptitude in a language who should be learning languages. 
If you don't, then forget it. Just stick with your, your native language and you'll be okay, hopefully. And so, um, mindset, and certainly Carol Dweck and others, acknowledge that people um, are born with strengths, but Carol Dweck says that most of it, and I believe this to be certainly to be the case with languages, is hard work, efforts, strategies, the right environment, and so forth. Lightbone and Sparta, apart from talking about aptitude, they talk about things like age, they talk about motivation, um, and uh, exposure to the language, and so forth. So, just to clarify here, Carol Dweck talks about people with a fixed mindset, there's nothing you can do about it if you're not born good at something, and a growth mindset. And a student uh, who has a fixed mindset often avoids challenges. They get defensive and they give up easily. They see effort as fruitless and ignore, they ignore useful negative feedback and they feel threatened by the success of others. However, a student with a growth mindset embraces challenges, persists after setbacks, sees effort as the path to mastery, learns from criticism, and finds lessons and inspiration in the success of others. And occasionally we have conversations with students, and I had a conversation with one, and I wish I'd recorded what this student said, because I was giving results back, and I was t talking to the students individually outside of the class, and she just said exactly what I was about to say to her, which was, I feel I've been working really hard, I make lots of mistakes, but I really feel that occasionally I'm actually getting there. And sometimes I, I get frustrated and I feel that I'm not getting anywhere. And then the next day I say all these things and I think, oh wow, I am actually making progress. Um, that student really has a growth mindset. All right. A growth-minded student sees a disappointing grade as a challenge to do better next time. And we all know the challenges of giving a disappointing grade to a student and having them think about the broader context and having to think about what they can take away from that grade, not just being upset because they got a B and they usually get A's. Tries hard all or most of the time, listens to and heeds teacher advice. Um, and another area of great interest of mine is feedback. Uh, the sorts of feedback that we give as teachers and take from students, sees learning as a journey with highs and lows, exciting parts and disappointments. They persevere, they talk with the teacher about how to do better next time, and they give it a go at the risk of making mistakes. I believe all of this is extremely important in um, promoting languages, and I believe that whilst growth mindset has been around for a number of years, Carol Dweck um, has put out an updated version of her book Mindset, which came out two years ago, so some updated um, research there, but the, the basic premise is the same. Um, I believe that whilst we are all aware of growth mindset, I believe that it needs to really be made explicit to students exactly what growth mindset in languages is. I'm wondering if um, anybody's come across this book, Babel No More. We all know the story about Babel. Um, the author is Michael Erard, and I believe it's fantastic reading for anybody involved in the teaching of languages, and I believe it's really good reading for students. And so I copied it, I ordered it through my library, and I've invited my Year 12s to read to borrow it out and read it. Sorry. Excuse me. Are you going to send the slideshow to everybody, or do we just take photographs? Uh, yes. No. No. I can make it available. Okay. I think I can make it available through through Lee. Happy to okay. to do that. No problem. Mm -hmm. So um, Babel No More documents, and I believe that Babel No More. What I took away from this book is it's all about aptitude, but there's lots of takeaways for all languages learners. It's about aptitude, but it's also about growth mindset. It documents some of the world's greatest language learners, what are called obviously polyglots or hyperpolyglots. And Michael Erard defines a hyperpolyglot as somebody who speaks more than 11 languages to a very high degree of proficiency. And I know there's lots of, there are lots of um, definitions of fluency 
um, out there. Claire Cramsh talks about fluency in terms of um, the way you can connect culture with language. Um, Van Patten came out with a definition, but for, for the purposes of this presentation, if we talk about a, a high level of proficiency, um, able to um, conduct um, uh, dialogue in a broad range or on a broad range of topics with relative um, ease and speed. Right. Michael Erard actually documents quite a few of them around the world. He travelled around the world and he researched a number of these um, people. But if I could um, just take you to this man here. Um, his name was Giuseppe Caspar Mezzofanti. I'm not sure you may have heard about um, him. Mezzofanti was born in 1774. He was classed as a hyperpolyglot. And he died in 1849. So he died at the age of 74 um, in the year 1849. So 74... Uh, that would have been very rare in 1849 um, to die at that age. Nowadays, 74, um, many people who are 74 uh, are very fit and healthy and, um, and enjoying life. Um, and perhaps it was the fact that he spoke lots of languages, maybe. Maybe he's proof that if you learn languages, then you can live longer. Um, but uh, he was a cardinal and also happened to be a hyperpolyglot. Uh, he initially came into contact with several foreign missionaries and so began to learn more and more languages, beginning with Swedish, German, Spanish and some Southern American native languages, and he studied Latin and Ancient Greek. When he was studying to be a priest, he also learned Asian languages. After becoming a priest, he also became a professor of Arabic, Hebrew, Asian languages and Greek at the University of Bologna. Now, uh, Michael Erard... Um, couldn't really conclude exactly how many languages he spoke. He thinks he's, he uh, was able to uh, use 11 languages with a high level of proficiency, but it was said that Mezzofanti spoke between 30 and 72 languages. He used to learn enough language to be able to visit uh, the sick and the dying um, in hospital. There is a story, but the author is, that Michael Erard is quite... Um, a little bit um, sceptical about this one, that um, somebody was sentenced to death for a terrible crime and he spoke a language, and I'm not sure what language he spoke, but the only one who could hear his confession was um, Giuseppe Mezzofanti and quickly learnt enough language to hear this man's confession before he went to the gallows. Um, we're not sure if that's a true story or not. But dating from the 1820s to the 1840s, he received letters in Latin, modern Greek, Italian, English, German, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Russian, Polish and Arabic. He also wrote and read in Dutch, Turkish, Hungarian and Catalan. He was corresponding in 15 languages using four different alphabets. Uh, so Michael Erard actually found all of this correspondence amongst boxes um, in, uh, in archives uh, that were in all these different um, languages. He did have the advantage of learning languages, especially between 1796 and 1800, when the armies of Napoleon and the Austrian dynasty battled over the strategic and political prize of Bologna, where hospitals filled up with wounded men from all over the Austrian Empire, which was linguistically diverse. So in that time, Mezzofanti improved his German, and he also learned Hungarian, Czech, Polish, Russian, Flemish, and perhaps Romani. Uh, he once wrote, I used to apply myself with all my energy to the study of the language of the patients until I knew enough of them to make myself understood. Through the grace of God, assisted by my private studies and by a retentive memory, I came to know not merely the generic languages of the nations to which several invalids belonged, but even the peculiar dialects of their various provinces. Um, I came across a joke about polyglots and hyperpolyglots, and it's that many polyglots, when they're writing a text on their phone, get halfway through the text and realise that they were using the wrong keyboard. Um, so, um, Michael Erard 
analyzed and spoke to a lot of experts, including Claire Crunch, um, Van Patten, and a number of he's uh, he's got degrees in linguistics. Um, but he spoke to a lot of experts, and he came to the conclusion that what it takes for somebody to learn many languages at a very high degree of proficiency uh, are three things. He says some neural hardware that's exceptionally suited to the activity of learning languages and to the ability to use many of them, a sense of mission about learning languages and an identity as a language learner. This hardware is a set of either structural or anatomical features that act as precursors to exceptional outcomes. If they are recruited by the right sorts of practice in the right sorts of context, one, say, that recognises foreign language abilities as a desirable trait. The precursors might include a high-performing phonological loop, an anatomically larger primary auditory cortex, which enables the learner to hear distinctions in speech sounds in the non-native language more easily, differences in the hippocampus, that's the area of the brain that has to do with memory, that enable the learning and easy recall of new language material, some as yet unidentified ability to control multiply represented languages, or some variations in hormones or neurotransmitters that may increase plasticity and encourage the building of language circuits. However, Michael Erard talks a lot about neuroplasticity in his book and dedicates a whole section on the lessons that all language learners can learn from polyglots and hyperpolyglots. And I'll take you to, to some of those. Um, that was a video that I was going to show of a, a polyglot, but um, I, I might skip over that. I'm happy to send the link. Some learnings from hyperpolyglots. If you want to improve at languages, you should find or construct your niche. And I read that as having to do with your identity as a language learner. What does it mean to learn a language? How do you make it part of your life? Um, uh, Erard talks about uh, when you're a language learner, you may feel like an outsider. And so uh, getting into your niche you're associating with other language learners, and so you can all be outsiders together. Um, it is a, a tough business being a language learner. Claire Crunch talks about the third place. It's neither your, the place of your native language, nor are you a native speaker of the language that you're using. And so you're negotiating what is called a third place, which goes uh, between, it's a very messy area, and requires a lot of no negotiation that goes between both the L1 and the L2. So finding the niche is very important. This next one, there's a lot of literature about this. Use native speakers as a metric of progress, though not as a goal. Um, Vivian Cook wrote a lot about that. Uh, we're not telling our students that they've got to speak exactly like French people. They are non-native users of French and it's a different type of proficiency that we're talking about. Manage your dopamine. Um, this is interesting. Um, it's the, um, uh, it's the uh, drug that has to do with pleasure when we do something pleasurable and then we want to do it um, next time. That finding that joy of learning a new language and communicating gives us dopamine and we need to find it in order to continue. Find flow. Um, Erard uh, gives the example of somebody um, listening to languages while they're exercising, getting into your zone, your language learning zone called, called flow. Building executive function and working memory skills. And there are lots of uh, things that we can do, uh, that testing ourselves and so forth. Developing a feel for the language, that has to do with a, the way a language behaves. Um, and things like agreements of adjectives um, uh, to agree with the gender of the, the noun and so forth. The way a language behaves and getting a feel for that. <clears throat> uh, find your tribe. Erard gives the example of people who go online um, and they communicate with other 
uh, learners and speakers of languages. Um, now, I'm investigating, in the past, at my previous school, we did a uh, video link up with a school in Sydney, and we did the same unit of work. And so what we did was we communicated by video link once every two weeks, where the students spoke French to each other and talked about their uh, unit of work. And they actually worked in virtual groups. Um, and the students kept in contact with each other and then they started making this blog where they created categories according to their um, particular interests. So I would actually like to do a lot more of that. And I believe that that falls into Erard's category of finding your tribe. People who understand what it's like to be learning uh, another language. And the last thing is whatever the method is, stick to the method. You have to tolerate the absence of quick success. And what was interesting is that Michael Erard did all of this research and towards the end of his research he found something he got very excited about. He went to right to the bottom of a box uh, and um, dusted, all, all dusted it off and he found Mezzofanti's vocabulary cards that he used to learn languages. Now I in 2019 like to advise my students to use vocabulary cards to test themselves and on Mezzofanti, so here's a man living in the 1800s using vocabulary cards where he's got uh, words and sentences in one language and then the meaning of it, um, presumably in Italian, on the other side. And uh, he was testing himself. Now we're doing this in 2019 and I know a number of students are using Quizlet, but here was somebody who was doing normal things uh, in order to learn his languages, even though he had a great um, aptitude. Um, Michael Erard uh, writes, in Mezzofanti's own time, his methods must have seemed sensibly industrious. Today they dazzle us only by their vigour and their persistence. Mezzofanti himself once said that even as an adult, he learnt languages like a schoolboy, writing out words and verb con conjugations and memorising them. He made good use of his time, making it more abundant. He talked to himself in his languages while he was alone. He read dictionaries, catechisms, vocabularies and literature of great variety. He sought people to talk to and he took notes on their conversations and whatever his method was, he stuck to it. One reason that Mezzofanti and people like him are so fascinating is that they seem to have leapfrog, leapfrogged the banality of method. This is Erard writing. They don't learn languages, they pick them up. They don't sit down and read lists of words, they absorb them. Nothing could be further from the truth. We hope that the methods are magic and that if we adopt those methods too, we might achieve great things. The truth is, Mezzofanti and others haven't escaped the banality of methods at all. They make the banality more productive. Their minds enjoy the banality. So, for me, that book was extremely positive and addresses the issue of people saying, well, you're either born at good at learning a language or you're not. And the basic premise of Erard's book is that here are some great language, language learners, here are lessons that we can learn from them, and it's possible that, e that everybody can um, learn several languages. Uh, Dr Michael Harrington at um, University of Queensland once said, um, when I was studying as part of my master's program, that most people around the world are capable of learning uh, several languages. Um, the exception are that the exceptions are, for example, people who have damage to that part of their brain, either through a misfortune like stroke or or that sort of thing, that they are unable, physically unable, to process and learn um, languages. The rest of us are more than capable of doing that. And so, what I like to say to my year nines and my year tens is that everybody in this room is capable of making good progress in a language through good efforts and strategies. Um, and we're going to set the bar really high and show you how to get there. All right. Um, the next 
uh, issue has to do with uh, multiple pathways. And I think that a lot of our students are getting messages from older people out there in society who said, well, uh, I'm a very successful lawyer or I'm a very successful doctor and I never needed a language. You may have got away at one point with not learning a language and having a very successful career. That is not the case anymore. And I, I believe that we need to be telling our students this. And that is reflected in what young people uh, at universities are doing nowadays. Very occasionally I have the pleasure of bumping into former students uh, at my school, some of all house who come back to do tutoring and all sorts of things. And I ask them what they're doing and they tell me what they're doing as if you know, this is perfectly normal. They said, well, I've just, I've just come back from Berlin, kept up my German, I've just come back from Berlin where I got work experience in a law firm. And I say, that's absolutely amazing, and they kind of look a little bit shocked, as if, but that's just, that's what we do. Um, nowadays, it is seen as a very um, important thing to do to get experience in other countries, keeping up one's language, and experiences that we can only uh, have sp uh, speaking another language um, and that is highly beneficial to one's career back in Australia. Just one example, um, a student I taught very early on in my teaching career who went on to study nursing at university, she kept her French going. Uh, she was getting C's and B's, she wasn't a bad student, she worked very hard and she kept her French going uh, while she was doing her nursing degree. And she graduated at the age of 22, 23, and didn't re couldn't really find a job, uh, and eventually signed up to be a volunteer for Médecins Sans Frontières in an African country, I think it was Togo in, in Africa. And she worked for a year as a volunteer for Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, interacting with French doctors, not many of them, she said the resources were virtually non-existent and she was given a lot of duties that uh, a nurse, that only doctors can do um, in Australia. Uh, but because of the shortage of doctors and because of the shortage of resources, she was given a lot of responsibility. It was tough and I don't suggest it for every student. It was a tough year that she went through. She didn't earn much money. The experiences she got were absolutely amazing. When she came back, she was interviewed for a position in Sydney um, as a nurse, and they not only offered her the position, a position as a nurse in, in the hospital at St Vincent's, but they offered her a position as a woman only in her early 20s as nursing manager, so she was supervising a number of nurses, um, and they were extremely impressed by her, uh, the experience that she had gained working for Médecins Sans Frontières. There are also other examples of uh, university students who've, who've uh, studied law, for example, and gone and got work experience in law firms in France, Germany, China, Japan. Now, the law in those countries is v very different from the law in Queensland, but that's not the point. They followed lawyers, they sat in on interviews, they went to court, and when they were interviewed for a position back in Australia, um, they were able to say, well, these are the experiences that I gained from a law firm in Europe. And here's the sort of interview techniques that they use over there. And I, I would propose that I bring that to your law firm. Here's the sort of pr procedures and processes that they follow here. I'm wondering if that would be useful here. Because nowadays employers are looking for good academic record, obviously, like they always have, but initiative and experience. And it's that experience that you can, get, you can only gain by speaking other languages. And this is the trend. This is not my suggestion. This is what school leavers are doing and are finding normal. So my message to students is that languages aren't a luxury. They're really a necessity now. Because if you don't speak another language, you're competing against everybody else who does. Um, so that's, that's um, multiple pathways. I'll just, um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, uh, Institute of Modern Languages at University of Queensland, while people are doing their degrees, is, is an option to keep their languages going. I like to talk to students about the Diploma of 
uh, languages at UQ, that's on the website, UQ for example, but um, many other universities, that they can enrol in the Diploma of Languages while they're doing their law or their engineering or their science, keep their language going as a tool for later on. Uh, university exchange programs in a number of disciplines. You can do a six month study uh, stint in um, France, many countries around the world and have it credited towards your UQ degree and only pay UQ fees. That's just a UQ example. As I say, it applies to other universities as well. Um, and uh, so that, that gets um, students really excited there. Um, we need to have these links with universities because we need to, I think, uh, help them with the transition into university but give them as much information as possible um, that's out there. Because we're also hearing a lot of things like, um, I'm not doing a language, I'm doing the prerequisites that will get me into this course. And my argument is, that's fine if you want to think that way, but it is very short-sighted and that's not uh, how young people should be thinking, I believe. Um, <clears throat> my next uh, bit of reading and thoughts, um, this is say, the latest edition of Why Gender Matters by Dr Leonard Sachs. And um, Dr Sachs quotes a number of studies uh, from the neurological field that uh, looks at the differences in girls and boys' brains and the implications of those for teaching and learning, particularly. He talks about a number of other areas of life, but we won't talk about that now. He talks about things like friendships and um, relationships and so forth. Um, this is to do with teaching and learning. And understanding, and, and uh, Leonard Sachs says this, that we can't stereotype boys and girls. We can't say, you're a girl, so you learn this particular way. You're a boy, so you learn in that particular way. Just as much as you can't say to a 14-year-old, well, you're 14, so therefore you learn in this particular way, all learners are, are unique and have different learning styles. However, we can't escape the neurological findings about female and male brains. And I'd like to just give you some examples. I wrote an article a few years ago um, that, so I read Leonard Sachs's book um, that came out in 2005, and this, uh, the updated version, uh, came out in 2017. It's got a whole lot of updated research. But <clears throat> I read that and I thought, well, I'm interested in the implications of that for the teaching and learning of languages. And I came to a few conclusions. So uh, one of the differences that Sachs and other authors if you're interested in reading um, literature about gender, Dr. Linda Sasser um, is another academic who writes about gender. Um, this is one big difference. The, the amygdala and the uh, cerebral cortex, so the amygdala at the bottom of the, the base of the brain there that deals with uh, particularly negative emotion, and the cerebral cortex that uh, has to do with language, uh, regulation, um, of actions. It's the motor room, if you like, of the brain. It regulates your behaviour. Um, and the findings are in the book that young girls, and I'm talking prepubescent, um, have already developed a connection between the amygdala and the cerebral cortex, meaning that uh, they are able to articulate uh, if they're sad or upset or frightened. They're able to articulate from quite an early age because of the connections between the cerebral cortex and the amygdala. In males, that connection happens a lot later. So uh, Dr Sachs suggests that uh, that has implications for teaching and learning. When we're asking um, students, for example, to um, take the role of a, um, of a character in a novel, for example, or to ask them how this person would have felt in this particular situation. He's suggesting that many girls might find it a lot easier to do that than 
boys, and I'm talking about teenagers. Um, <clears throat> and this is based on neurological findings. That's one thing. Um, and so I suggested, I, uh, in, in this article that I wrote, I made suggestions about how that could affect um, languages, teaching and learning without stereotyping them both. I, I stress that for female learners in a languages classroom, a typical activity within the study of a film might be to have the students taking the role of a particular character in a studied film and discuss perspectives and feelings from that character's point of view. Male students, on the other hand, may benefit from and enjoy more a greater focus on objectivity in their study of the film, for example, writing a film review. Uh, Leonard Sachs's uh, very well-known quote is that there are no differences in what boys and girls can learn. There are no differences, but there are big differences in the way we can teach them. And as I'll um, uh, conclude, um, th there are big Im implications for promotion of languages, particularly when people are saying, for example, um, you know, boys really can't learn languages, can they? Uh, <clears throat> and the second example is to do with the um, corpus callosum in the brain, which is the, the, bun uh, the, the bunch of um, uh, nerves which connect the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Uh, that connection is a lot stronger in the female brain than in the male brain. Uh, again, Leonard Sachs quotes a lot of um, neurological findings. And so it may be that a female learner can make connections between their language and other areas of their, cu their curriculum a lot more easily than boys could. Um, so for, I'll uh, give you an example. If we're in French class and I'm asking students to think about what they've <coughs> been doing in physics and chemistry um, and geography and making connections. Um, there are some other findings um, in why gender matters. There's a greater need for males to move in order to learn. Males and females differ in responses when in fight or flight. Um, that sometimes a bit of stress for boys is a good thing. Um, competition is a good thing. Whereas a lot of female learners will actually, that will actually be a barrier for their learning. Girls can be more motivated to establish a positive relationship with and please the teacher. Girls tend to use landmarks to give directions. The big white house with the green fence and um, the one which is at the corner of the street and that wraps around and it's got a really nice veranda. Boys tend to use distances and compass points about 300 metres down the road and then you turn left and so forth. Girls tend to prefer fiction more than boys and boys tend to prefer non-fiction. Leonard Sachs actually interviewed hundreds of teenagers and came to these conclusions. Girls tend to have more of a personal connection to their learning than boys. Um, <clears throat> so moving along, another thought that I've had recently, and this is not really... Um, to do with any readings I've done, but I believe that um, emphasis needs to be put on how well languages fit with other areas of the curriculum. And I'm, I'm trying this out on students, like I'm saying if you're, if you're fantastic at drama, if you really enjoy drama, well, languages can help you with that. Um, if you're great at music, languages can help you with that. Let's sit down and have a bit of a chat. So uh, I'm not really saying it's an either or, I'm saying it goes really well with, with your other subjects. Now I know that makes their decision hard when it comes to choosing a language, um, but these are the sorts of conversations which I think we need to have with students. As I'm walking along the other day um, from class, uh, one of my year nine students was walking along and she's really, she's got a fantastic voice. She's a very, very good music student and she has a music, uh, uh, a voice teacher. And I was sort of, apart from saying, isn't the weather nice today? I said, oh, I said, um, you know, I said, I, I heard, you know, there was an announcement staff briefing about the a competition that she'd won. And I said, have you ever sung in French? Because I'm her French teacher. And she said, no, I haven't actually. I said, you should. I said, why don't you talk about it with your music teacher? 
and I said, I can send you a few songs or I can send you, teach you a few songs. And she said, oh, that's a really good idea. And she's been doing that. And I had her parents at parent-teacher interviews. And uh, the, fa the first thing the father said was, well, you know, thanks very much, Mr. Fauna. And I said, oh, well, what's that for? And he said, um, he said, well, the good thing is she wants to continue with her French. But you've talked to her about singing in French and so forth. And now she's hitting us up to go to Paris. Mm. And uh, I said, well, he said, so thanks very much. He said that actually sarcastically. I said, no, don't thank me. I'm just doing my job. Um, so anyway, that's a good thing. She said she's going to do it because of her. So I, I believe that we need to um, have discussions with, um, other, with teachers of other disciplines and talk a lot more about the inter interdisciplinary. Um, now, the next thing is, oh, sorry, I'll go back to um, other areas of the curriculum and talk a little bit about NAPLAN. And um, as I say, there's, there's a lot of views about NAPLAN out there. And um, uh, regardless of how people feel about NAPLAN, I believe that we need to send the message to parents and students that languages can help you a lot, just as much as all of the other areas of the curriculum with NAPLAN preparation. So I'm talking about students who are preparing for NAPLAN in Year 9, um, starting to, to uh, embed uh, NAPLAN type, type uh, thinking skills um, into Year 8 and Year 9 um, languages. I think that, and I was having a look through the, some of the NAPLAN papers that the students have just done in Year 9, and I actually think the new senior syllabus um, it, they, a lot of the skills align themselves very well with the skills, that, the cognitions that are required in the senior syllabus. Um, things like writing a persuasive text, I actually think that we can have a lot of overlap there where we're um, helping them to prepare for their NAPLAN and we're also helping them to prepare for the senior syllabus. Um, this notion that we, we need to meet head on, I think this notion that well, English, maths, social science, are really the only areas that can help students with their NAPLAN because the NAPLAN's in English and it's about English and maths. Well, I'd like to stand up in front of students and say, well, we can help you very much for NAPLAN. Now, the students mightn't be keen about NAPLAN, but parents hearing that message, uh, people want to do well at NAPLAN because you've got to, you've got to um, produce your NAPLAN results in order to enrol at other schools and so forth. Um, and I'd like to um, keep in contact with people if you're interested because I'm working with my school administration about how we can embed NAPLAN, some NAPLAN preparation activities in languages classes and do it all in the language but have similar types of questions using stimulus from the study language. I'd like to sort of get, get those discussions um, happening if, if you're interested. So. Um, some messages then to add to our repertoire that I propose adding to the repertoire, therefore. Our students, and that we actually say this to students and parents and our stakeholders, is that our students have an amazing capacity to learn several languages. We're not asking them to learn several languages, we're just asking them to learn one. Uh, our students can make themselves into good language learners. There's no such thing as somebody being born um, <clears throat> and they can do nothing about their um, uh, ability to learn languages. They can make themselves into good language learners. Language learning is rigorous and relevant. <clears throat> the satisfaction of making progress is fun and feels good. I got that from the dopamine thing that Michael Erard um, spoke about. Um, I believe that the word rigorous actually lends itself well to, fits in well with language promotion. Um, I think that most students' definition of fun is not sitting around watching videos, videos are important in class, but sitting and relaxing. I believe that most students' definition of fun is working hard and getting satisfaction from, the, from their learning, making mistakes, learning from them and engaging with the messiness and the, the, uh, the, the rocky path that can be 
learning a language, but the satisfaction is truly great. Learning a language can help our students to forge a career in any area. And uh, then go on to talk about the multiple pathways and the options available uh, at tertiary level. Girls and boys can be as successful as, e at e uh, as successful as each other at learning languages and we cater for gender. And I'm, I'm enjoying saying to parents, uh, so uh, I speak to parents at year 10 subject selection evening and I like to say, you know, these are the sorts of activities that we do to cater for your daughter. And I think that if I were in a boys' school uh, now, I'd be saying, well, you know, boys are more than capable of doing really well in the language. Um, and here are the sorts of, the, here are the ways that we teach them because we're very familiar with um, uh, the way boys learn without stereotyping them. Languages sit very nicely with other subject areas. <clears throat> and languages play a key role in NAPLAN preparation. And uh, just some thoughts, some ways forward to help our languages promotion. Um, <clears throat> it'd be interesting to document the journeys of those who have used a language to enhance their traditional career uh, in Australia. So I'm not talking about, you know, using your language directly in your career, translating and interpreting and so forth, but somebody who's become a really successful engineer, lawyer, doctor, and they've got a language to thank uh, for that. Um, to explain aptitude more fully and document those with less aptitude, however you define that, who have successfully learnt languages and the journey that they took. I love it when a former student is studying a language at university, but he says, I found it so difficult in year 10 and I was getting C's, but here I am at university, I kept it going. It's been a hard path, but I don't regret a minute of it. To create and share strategies that are embedded in language programs that help students to prepare for NAPLAN. To ensure the link between school and universities and to ensure school students are aware of further tertiary uh, study options. So just some concluding thoughts. Um, getting back to some of the myths that I referred to earlier, I hope that some of those suggestions might go to addressing some of these uh, inaccuracies that are spoken out there along the lines of it's only smart kids who do languages. Uh, languages are so inclusive nowadays. I was never able to learn languages. Well, there may have been reasons for that, but your brain was certainly capable of it. The issue about boys, the issue about NAPLAN, and the issue of wanting to do a career in Australia, and therefore I don't need a language. I'm hoping that those suggestions would go some way to addressing um, those. And so just some concluding thoughts. Like other areas of languages, teaching and learning, the notion of languages promotion is obviously something that's a work in progress, as factors like the needs of our students and the nature of our world change. So please, um, let's continue the conversation. And finally, let's keep up the good fight as we language teachers do. That's not meant to be a violent, it's a, a peaceful fight. So that all of our students enjoy meaning, meaningful connections with other humans out there, both locally and globally, or better put to respect John Donne's legacy so that no man or woman or child is an island. Thanks very much for listening. Much appreciated.